What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 254 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for October 10th, 2018. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. And as always, if you guys want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, Drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So with all that being said, guys, let's get started here with the first question from DarkmanX16 from YouTube. What's with the overkill of shows WWE is doing? I haven't kept up with wrestling in months, only to come back to waiting for SmackDown 1000. Now I found out they had Super Showdown and Crown Jewel added to the mix. How are they able to manage this and build up an all-women's pay-per-view? That's the biggest problem with WWE programming right now. And I was talking to someone about this yesterday. I was in class, and some kid had found out I was a wrestling fan. I was discussing it openly in class. He came to me afterwards. We talked for like a fucking hour and a half about the current state of WWE and just shit from the last several years and just everything wrestling-related in general. Um, but I, I mentioned to him, like, he had said, you know, Raw being three hours is a problem and SmackDown's better than Raw. And, you know, I agree. I agree with all of that. But I think the biggest problem with the current state of WWE is that they focus on way too many things at one time. And they've been doing this since SummerSlam. They have the fucking Hell in the Cell pay-per-view. Next up after that, they have Evolution. And then Survivor Series. But in the middle, they have Super Showdown. They have Crown Jewel. They have Mixed Match Challenge going on right now. They have 205 Live, NXT, SmackDown 1000. It's way too much shit. How can they... Expect fans to care about any one event when they don't treat any one of these events as being special. Like, they'll do a decent job of building up each one of these shows, but then they'll move right into the next one, which is fine, but it's like Crown Jewel's getting all this attention right now for the World Cup, and that's just grand. But then SmackDown 1000 is kind of like the ugly stepchild right now, getting zero attention from WWE. Now, granted, they have since added a bunch of stuff for the show next Tuesday that I was complaining about a few weeks ago. They have since added... Evolution on the show, they added Rey Mysterio coming back to face Shinsuke Nakamura in a World Cup qualifier, they have The Undertaker coming back, Edge coming back, I know I know I, I, I'd seen Vicky Guerrero was advertised by the Arena website, and Michelle McCool, and a few others, and that's awesome, but still, SmackDown 1000 should feel like a much bigger deal than it currently does, SmackDown celebrating 1000 episodes is a grand occasion, yet they have not given it nearly as much hype, build, and attention as they did Raw 1000 several years ago, about six, seven years ago, back in 2012. You know, and I understand why. Raw's their baby. It's their flagship show. SmackDown just is not on that same level in their eyes. But still, they spent two fucking months building up Raw 1000 a few years ago, whereas SmackDown 1000, they have literally advertised everything in the show within, like, two weeks let alone two months for Raw 1000, which, in my opinion, is ridiculous. So, the biggest issue with WWE right now, I think, is the overkill of shows. It's just way too many. And the issue, it would be one thing if they were all great shows, but they're fucking not. They're not. Super Showdown was as skippable, it was as skippable as it could be. Hell in a Cell was pretty good, but I cannot name, like, one truly great show this main roster company has put on in 2018. Aside from the takeovers from NXT, I cannot name one amazing pay-per-view this company has had in the year of 2018. So again, they should probably focus on one show before advertising this, advertising that, building up this, gotta hype that show and this show and this. It's like focus on one thing at a time and then we'll get to the next thing. Like I miss the good old days of building the one pay-per-view a month and making that pay-per-view as grand as could be. And they did an awful job of that years ago, and they still do an awful job of that, an awful job of that from time to time, of making pay-per-views feel special. And worse yet, they're adding more shows to the mix that feel equally unimportant. So again, I think that's a big problem right now with WWE. I know it's all about making money. They're making more money now than they ever have before. So they don't give a shit if the shows are good. As long as they make money, whether it's Australian money, Saudi Arabian money, the dumb marks in Long Island going to Evolution or going to... Smacked on 1000 in Washington, D.C. They don't care. As long as they have your money and you're still paying for the network to watch all these shows to the WWE network, you're paying, you're, you're putting your money in their pocket for the network, they don't give a shit. 
So I'm not saying stop watching, that'll change anything. I don't think it will. Because there's a lot that goes on and the money that they make that go, th th there's a lot more that goes on than just the money that you pay them. So it's not like if you cancel your network subscription, it's going to matter one iota. I, I doubt it would matter one iota. I mean, you can try. You can't change anything if you don't do anything. But at the same time, um, there's, there's a lot more that goes into it than just that. So I don't know how they're able to manage all this shit and still build to the first ever all women's pay-per-view, which I think is a great idea. But I just got done talking about this to uh, Randy Cruz on the Two Out of Three Falls podcast last night. Check that out as well. It doesn't feel special. Like, it's cool they're having an all-women's pay-per-view, and they just added Charlotte and Becky, last woman standing. That's awesome. The tag team match, though, eh, I really don't care. I honestly don't. Alexa Bliss and Mickey versus Trish and Lita? I mean, cool. And it's better than having the two singles matches, which really meant nothing at all. They announced that with zero hype or build or anything. Oh, it's a dream match. Is it really, though? Is Alexa Bliss versus Trish Stratus really a dream match? Yeah, there's similarities between the two. Is it really a dream match? No, not really. A Bl Alexa Bliss really is not that good. And I don't know how good Trish is going to be at this point in her career, 12 years after she officially retired from the ring. Putting her in there with Alexa Bliss one-on-one -on -one will not be the best idea. Now she can mix it up with Mickey. They can rekindle that rivalry that they teased back at the Women's Rumble earlier this year. I like that idea a lot. I'm looking forward to Kyrie Sane and Shayna Baszler. Part three, I think it would be. Part four. Um, for the NXT Women's Championship. They're having the finals in the Mae Young Classic, which I'm sure is going to be great. But none of that has to do with the fucking main roster. I'm talking about the main roster. What's Bailey doing? What's Banks doing? What's Asuka doing? Nothing. What, facing fucking Alicia Fox and Naomi and the Iconics? No one gives a shit. Nobody. So stop promoting Crown Jewel. I'm not saying stop promoting it, but it's like they space these they, they space thing, these pay-per-views out very poorly. They have Evolution on that Sunday before Halloween. And then Crown Jewel fucking five days later on that Friday. Some certain things they can't control. I understand that. But that, to me, screams poor planning. His second question... I also saw WWE.com's top 15 SmackDown superstars. Did you agree with the list they made? So I looked up the list um, right after you asked me the question. So for those of you that did not see the list, let me run down it real quick. Not a great list, to say the least, but this is what they have. Top 15 SmackDown superstars. And again, just a bit of a disclaimer here. WWE puts these lists together knowing that you're going to fucking complain about it and tweet about it and debate about it online. Just anything to get people talking is the pure purpose of these lists. That's the pure purpose of these lists. So don't get it mixed up. Don't be, um, don't get all butthurt about the fact that, oh, you know, a fucking, you know, this guy's on the list and that person's not. Like, it's www.com. They do this shit on purpose. Some lists are good. Some lists are not as good. This one, I thought, left a lot to be desired. But anyway, top 15 SmackDown superstars in WWE.com's opinion. 15, Michelle McCool. Read into that what you will. 14, JBL. 13, John Cena. 12, Randy Orton. 11, Becky Lynch. 10, Rey Mysterio. 9, The Fucking New Day. Okay. The 8, The Usos. Seven, Kurt Angle. Six, Batista. Five, Eddie Guerrero. Four, Edge. Three, AJ Styles. Two, The Undertaker. And one, The Rock. I can do an entire podcast devoted to this list alone and making my own list. And I know I have made a list talking about the top 15 or top 10 SmackDown superstars. I did it about four or five years ago when SmackDown celebrated 15 years on the air. And I thought my list was better than this. Um, again, that was pre-brand split. The second brand split, anyway. AJ would be nowhere near the top three. I love AJ Styles. He has been the he has been the face of SmackDown since arriving on the show two years ago, and he's done a lot to make that show matter since 2016. But that's two years. He does not belong on the, on this list. I mean, at least in the top three, AJ belongs on the list. I should not say that he does not belong in the entire list. Top three is being a little generous, a little generous. I'd put AJ even, probably not even my top five. Top ten, maybe? Top five, top three, no. Absolutely not. 
I do agree with the top two. I like Taker and Rock. Um, I think those two belong in the top two of the list. Taker was on the show for fucking 10 years. From like 02 to 2011, 2012, up until he retired from full-time in-ring competition, active competition. So, Taker belongs on the list. The Rock's the number one because he came up with the show. If it wasn't for him, I'm not even sure SmackDown would be a thing. He came up with the word SmackDown. So, I can see why he's number one. It, they would be remiss to not to try to bring in The Rock for SmackDown 1000. If anything, I hope they get like a pre-taped video from him or something. I hope he can show up and make a surprise return. But if not, oh well. Edge belongs on this list. I like him. In, I would put him in the top three. I think the top three should be Rock, Taker, and Edge. Not Rock, Taker, and AJ. Eddie belongs in this list. I, I'm, I'm very happy that he made the list. Batista, too. I think he's a little low at number six because he did a lot for that show from 05 to like 20... 2009, 2010. Rey Mysterio should be higher than number 10. The guy was a cornerstone of that show for years. He debuted on SmackDown in 02. He was a part of the Cruiserweight division, the tag team division. He was a mid-card guy. He was world champion multiple times. He did a lot for SmackDown from 02 to like 2011. Did Rey Mysterio. So I would, I would put him a little higher on the list. The New Day does not fucking belong in this list. I like the New Day. They've been on the show for, what, a cup of coffee? No. They debuted on the show in 2017. Give me a fucking break. The New Day does not belong on the top 10 SmackDown superstars, let alone the top 15. So, no. Becky Lynch, same thing. I'm sorry, she shouldn't, she does not belong in this list. Yeah, she was the first women drafted a SmackDown in the 2016 draft. She did a, really not a lot for a majority of her stint on SmackDown. Yeah, she won the title. She became the inaugural SmackDown Women's Champion. What did she do after that? Nothing. 2017, she, she sat on the fucking sidelines. She only really became relevant again at SummerSlam earlier this year, a few months ago, when she regained the gold. Or, no, she regained the gold at Hell in a Cell, but when she turned heel, she became the face of that division. So Becky Lynch, I'm sorry, I like Becky. She does not belong in this list. Orton did way more for SmackDown. Cena did way more for SmackDown from 02 to 05. JBL did way more for SmackDown. Michelle McCool should be, uh, you know, I would put I would put Vicky Guerrero on the list. She's not really a superstar, but she did way more for this show than fucking Becky Lynch because she was the GM for a long time. Michelle McCool, you may not agree with it, but she did do a lot for the show. Um, she debuted on the show. She was on the show for, like, several years. She was never on Raw at any point. She won the Women's Championship over there. She won the Divas Championship over there. I'm glad Michelle McCool's on the list at number 15, because they didn't put her high up, but they also didn't take her off the list completely. Where the fuck is Brock Lesnar? How is Brock Lesnar not on this list? The guy dominated SmackDown from 02 to 04. Makes absolutely no sense for Brock Lesnar to not be on this list. That's really the only glaring omission. I can't think of many other people that should be on the list that aren't. Um, I mean, Chris Benoit, but for obvious reasons, he won't be on the list. He should be. In an ideal world, he would belong on this list. He, he won't be on this list. Jericho, eh, maybe. I mean, I see him more as a Raw guy than a SmackDown guy. Um, but overall, I think the list was okay. I would take off... Eh, the Usos have been a good staple for that tag team division since the, you know, rebirth of SmackDown in 2016. I still would not put them in the top 10. Not even close. Um, they have been great for SmackDown, but I would not put them in the top 10 whatsoever. Um, if there's any real... I don't know. What tag team would you put in that list, though? I can't think of any real tag team. Maybe Eminem? Like, even they weren't there for that long. But I don't know. I, I associate Eminem with SmackDown from, like, 05, 06. Um, Los Guerreros, I mean, Eddie Guerrero already has his own spot on the list, but Los Guerreros were a big part of SmackDown for a long time. I can't think of, like, anyone else, um, from, like, the early years of SmackDown. SmackDown, you know, tag teams weren't really their forte for a long time, so. I don't know, but overall, I thought the list was okay. I mean, again, I can go on for much longer about this list, but that's my, uh, two cents on it in a nutshell. His next question, I've also been meaning to get your opinion on something. Triple H said in an interview, Basically, he said that WWE does not want any more wrestlers to get bigger than the company like The Rock or Cena, which boggles my mind. But it also explains why no one is getting over anymore. Elias is a perfect example of this. He put out an album that reached the top 10 on iTunes, and WWE decides to barely promote it. 
When Cena and Lillian Garcia put out their first album, they promoted the shit out of their albums and performed their songs live on Raw. It's kind of sad when your wrestlers want to get to that rock level but can't because the company sabotages them and constantly has to bring back stars like The Rock to boost ratings. This has been the fucking recurring theme in this company for years now. They do not want anyone to be bigger than their own company. It's all about WWE. It's not about any one person. It's not about this guy or that guy. And I get the mentality because if that guy goes down, if that guy does something wrong, they have to boot him out of the picture like a Chris Benoit who was never the face of the company anyway. Or like, no, that's not really the, the, the worry. I think the worry in their eyes is that they build up someone as big as The Rock and then they leave for Hollywood or leave for other endeavors. So I get it. But at the same time, you are absolutely right. Anytime any one of their superstars is on the brink, on the cusp of superstardom and feeling different than everyone else in the roster, they cut their legs right from underneath them. They rip the rug right from underneath them. And they just fucking castrate these people into feeling like everyone else on their fucking show. Asuka felt special for a while. They decided to castrate her, have her lose to Charlotte, and then fucking Carmella twice, and now she's a loser. Shinsuke Nakamura felt special. He felt special when it came up. Only took him a few months to have him lose to fucking Jinder Mahal before he felt like everyone else on the show. Kevin Owens attacked Vince McMahon about a year ago. Felt special there for a while. Decided to move him into a pointless program with fucking... I, I don't even know. What did they even do with him? AJ Styles? Like, that meant... The feud meant nothing. Owens is a guy who felt special when he first got called up. Then they had him lose to John Cena twice. Twice. Clean. Ruining any momentum the guy had. You know, AJ feels special, not on the level of a Rock or a John Cena. No one does, except for Brock Lesnar, who barely shows up. I'm not even sure what his current deal is like with the company. I mean, again, this I can devote, I can devote an entire episode to talking about this alone. But... You can't help but, like, admit that a guy like Kevin Nash is right when he goes on the record and says, oh, no one cares about the current guys. You know what? He kind of has a point. I know there's a lot of people who like Seth Rollins out there. I love Seth Rollins. There's a lot of people out there who love AJ, who love Roman Reigns, who love Finn Balor. But the point of the matter is, is that none of these people feel like, like anyone can be a star. Not many people can be a superstar. I know they call everyone a superstar. They're, they call fucking Mike Kanellis a superstar. But I'm talking about <clears throat> like that ultra level of superstardom that very few people reach. A people, a person like The Rock or a John Cena or a Stone Cold Steve Austin or a Shawn Michaels or a Triple H. And because they don't allow anyone to get beyond a certain level, they have to rely on bringing people back like fucking Triple H, The Undertaker, Kane, Trip, uh, Shawn Michaels... John Cena, Brock Lesnar. Look at the next month of WWE TV alone. We have coming back alone for these shows. We have John Cena coming back, Brock Lesnar, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, The Undertaker, Kane, Trish Stratus, Kurt Angle, and Lita. What is this, the fucking ruthless aggression era? Like, what's going on here? Like, that's great. It brings more eyes to new shows, but they, they got to give people a reason to stay tuned. Yeah, you may bring back little Joey who used to watch wrestling back in 2003 after school on Monday nights or some shit, but he's not going to stay for the current guys if he doesn't give a shit about them. Like, they got to give people a reason to care and invest in the talent of today, not the people from years ago. And yeah, and I think a big problem is not the talent, because you look at the roster and it's like, this is the greatest wrestling roster I've ever seen. Why the fuck does no one care about 80% of this roster? People like The Revival. People like Finn Balor. People like... I don't even know. Shinsuke Nakamura. Asuka. Why do they feel so unimportant? Because they had momentum, and then WWE realizes either they do it intentionally, or they have no idea what they have with these people. But they fucking ruin them. And in some cases, they go out of their way to ruin these people. Like, it takes a real effort to fuck up a guy like a Finn Balor or a Shinsuke Nakamura. It doesn't take a fucking rocket scientist to figure out how to handle these people. Having Nakamura lose to Jinder fucking Mahal two pay-per-views in a row will really do some damage. 
And then they wonder, oh, why isn't he over? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You beat someone down. You beat someone down. You beat someone down for years on end. And then they finally decide one day, hey, you know what? Let's try to rehab this guy. And people aren't reacting within the first two weeks. Well, why isn't he over? Because you fucking ruined him. Look at Jack Swagger, the king of start and stop pushes. They ruined him for years. No one gave two shits about Jack Swagger. One day, they decide, they, they, they decide to start pushing him again. Move him over to SmackDown. No one gave a shit. And they wonder, well, why isn't he over? Well, because you had him losing to Santino Morella on, on Superstars one week. You had him losing the fucking Titus O'Neil on Main Event. Like, give me a fucking break. Like, you people are the problem. The company, maybe not the company, but just one man alone, Vince McMahon, is the issue here. That's really what it comes down to. A guy like Adolph Ziggler, I'm shocked he was able to redeem himself this year by becoming IC champion a few times, by becoming Raw Tag Team champion, moving over to Raw, reinventing himself. He was a guy that this, he should still leave, but he was a guy that looked like he didn't care. He'd come out and he it looked like he did not give a shit. And it's not just his character. It was very apparent that Dolph was just like, get me the fuck out of here. Because there was just nothing left for him to do. And they booked him like a loser. He went like six months without winning a match. And then one week, he won the United States Championship. Try to explain that one for me. So again, I can do an entire episode devoted on this topic alone. Devoted to this, devoted to this topic alone. But for right now, I'll just say that. Just because it's very frustrating when you're right. They do not allow people to get over to the level they could be over at. People have said in the past, that have worked there, saying that you will only be as popular, you will only be as good as they will allow you to be. As they want you to be. Like Jinder Mahal, they can take any loser off the street and make him WWE champion. It takes effort. They put in effort into making Jinder Mahal a world champion caliber competitor. He never really fit into that role. Zack Ryder probably would have been a would, would have been a better fit than fucking Jinder Mahal, but Zack Ryder's character was an Indian, and they were about to tour India. And that was the pure purpose of putting that championship on Jinder. Because what's he doing now? Exactly, nothing, nothing. Losing to Finn Balor and fucking Bailey every week on Raw, which is what he should be doing, but he should never have been a world champion to begin with. Moving on, FD from Facebook. With all the predictability of the matches happening on WWE major events lately, with how the internet rumor mill works, always being a factor like what's happening with the build-up to Evolution, do you think this will deter the viewer's interest on watching the event and why? So, I, I think what you're trying to ask me is, like, with all the predictability on the shows recently and how predictable they are and how obvious it is to predict the outcomes of matches, will that affect the interest in Evolution? Yeah, to an extent, but really it's all about what they have on tap. It doesn't really matter whether it's predictable. I mean, to an extent, yeah, but if it's presented as a big deal, then it doesn't matter. Dude, like, a lot of the takeovers are very predictable. A lot of the NXT takeovers are very predictable, but they're fucking great shows because the in-ring action is excellent, the storytelling is excellent, and they never cease to deliver a big fight feel for their takeovers. Like I said earlier, when was the last time WWE had a show that had like a big fight feel? Like, holy shit. I cannot wait for this show. Maybe WrestleMania. There was a lot of hype surrounding WrestleMania 34 because it had a lot of potential on paper. I don't think it lived up to the hype. I thought it was a good show. I don't think it was a great show by any means. So, overall, um, I don't know. I think for Evolution, I think that the real issue there is the fact that like I said earlier, they're focusing on way too many shows at once with Crown Jewel, SmackDown 1000, Survivor Series, and all this other shit. They're already promoting Royal Rumble for January. So it's like, focus on one thing at a time. Evolution, yeah, they have a couple matches announced that I'm looking forward to. But like, what are the rest of the women on the main roster doing? Like I said, Sasha Banks, Bailey, Asuka, what are they doing on the show? What are they up to? Right now, it does not seem like it's going to be anything significant because they're not telling stories. Nia Jax, Ember Moon, were they going to face off again? No one gives a shit. So, it's not really the predictability. That's not really the problem. The problem is that they're not doing a good enough job of getting me excited for the show, regardless of who wins or not. I don't really care about that as much. 
Super Showdown was predictable as fuck, but the fact that it was presented like a glorified house show made me not care. Because nothing significant happened on the show. And when you do the rematches two fucking days later on Raw, it sends the message, why did I bother wasting my time watching Super Showdown in the first place? There are two biggest matches on the show with the Raw women's six-man, six-woman tag team match and then the Shield six-man. They did the rematches two days later on Raw. And then Becky and Charlotte again on SmackDown, which was actually pretty good. But still, it sends the message, hey, don't bother watching that show. It's a waste of your time. They're putting all their money, they're putting all their eggs in the TV basket. And that's fine. But their pay-per-views are suffering because none of them feel special. The pay-per-views are a setup for TV, where in reality, it really should be the other way around. Now, I'm not saying Raw and SmackDown should be pointless. I mean, Raw has felt pointless for a while now. But Raw and SmackDown serve to exist. They exist to serve to promote the pay-per-views. Not host everything and, and feature, the ti- feature the title changes and the heel turns and the everything. Like, NXT TV is a prime example of that. Now, it's not on network TV. It's a little different. But, you know, NXT TV still has great matches like Pete Dunne and Ricochet. But when the time comes to make the takeovers matter, they, they fucking matter. I have yet to see a takeover that did not leave me overly satisfied. I cannot say that about any one pay-per-view this year in WWE. Next question from FD from Facebook. Do you think Shingo Tahaki on Takahagi, I don't know how you pronounce his name, who is actually a Dragon Gate mainstay for a while, or has been a Dragon Gate mainstay for a while, FYI, is a good pick of the new member of the Los Ingobernables de Japón and why? Um... I guess. I have no idea who that guy is. I don't care about Los Ingobernables de Japón. I've seen them in Ring of Honor a few times, and as well as on a few of the New Japan shows. They're good. They're a great faction. Uh, Tagahage? I don't know who the hell he is. Shingo? I have no clue who he is, so I can't really comment on that. With the current heat between Bullet Club members and the new president of New Japan Pro Wrestling about the New Japan Pro Wrestling new working procedures and style according to some reports, do you think this will affect Bullet Club as a whole? And will this mean they're ready to be WWE bound if the New Japan Pro Wrestling Management does not settle this conflict well? Well, first of all, that's news to me. I did not know that members of Bullet Club had heat with the president of New Japan um, about new working procedures and style and stuff, maybe toning it down. I that I did not know that. Um, I don't know if that's a storyline thing or if that's a real thing. You're making it sound like it's a real thing. So I'll go off of that. But what makes you think that if New Japan is having them tone down their in-ring style, that WWE would be any different. It's almost comical that you would even suggest that. Like, WWE, they would allow them to do whatever they want. I mean, yeah, they might be getting paid more to do the exact same thing. But creatively, they have zero control. I'm not saying they have complete control of their creative characters in New Japan, but they have much more freedom over there compared to what they would have in WWE. I think they will make their way to WWE eventually, I honestly don't think it's happening in 2019. I don't think it should happen in 2019. I think Cody has much more to accomplish on his own outside of that company before coming back at some point. Kenny Omega, I guess you can make the argument, yeah, he should come over at some point soon. He's already won the IWGP Heavyweight Championship and the Young Bucks. What else can they do outside of WWE? I don't know, but if they're going to WWE because of heat they have with the New Japan president, then go to fucking Ring of Honor or something. I don't know, like... That doesn't really seem to make much sense. I don't think they would leave to go to WWE for that reason alone. It's either because they're getting paid or getting offered an insane amount of money they can't turn down, or because they just want to try something new. Not because of New Japan saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that anymore. You might as well just leave if you're not happy here. I I don't see that being the case. I really don't. Because I don't think WWE would be much different. If anything, they'd be worse in that respect of not allowing them to do a lot of stuff they would normally do. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine. His first question was, do you feel that Evolution will be a mess or an unexpectedly good show? I think it's going to be a good show. I think it's hard to go wrong with like Kyrie Cena and Shayna Baszler. I think it's going to be a good show for the stuff that WWE can't control. And that's kind of sad to say, but like none of the main roster storylines right now, at least for the women, are doing anything for me except for Becky and Charlotte. Now, I would close the show with Becky and Charlotte. I don't think they will. It's a last woman standing match, first time ever on the main roster. I would have that close to the show. Do I think it will? Nope, they'll probably close with Ronda and Nikki because that's like their version of Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. The match could exceed expectations. I honestly have zero expectations for Ronda Rousey 
versus Nikki Bella. I really, I really have no expectations whatsoever. Um, I think they'll close out the show with that. I don't, not really looking forward to that. Even when Nikki is the heel, I can't say I'm all too thrilled about Rousey and Nikki. Um, Charlotte and Becky, I already talked about. I think that's going to be great. Zayn and Baszler, I think that's going to be great. Whatever they have doing with the NXT UK women, I think is going to be great. I think the Mae Young Classic Finals, whatever that ends up being, will be great. So again, um, I think a lot of the show will depend on people they either bring back or people from NXT and beyond. Not the current talent. Like, what's Sasha Banks doing? What's Bailey doing? What's Asuka doing? And it's got to be something that makes sense. I heard uh, the rumored card was Asuka versus Ember Moon. Yeah, they had a great feud in NXT. What the fuck have they done on the main roster? Asuka has been essentially buried on SmackDown. And I never usually use that word. I don't use that word lightly. So, and Ember Moon, too. I mean, she's done well. She's impressed. She hasn't lost many matches. But she hasn't been involved in anything meaningful in the fucking six months she's been on the show. And that's a shame. But I do think it's going to be a good show despite the lack of build and lack of excitement for Evolution. I hope it's good. I think it will be good. If I had to choose mess or unexpectedly good show, I'll say a good show just because I'm optimistic like that. His second question, why WWE completely, or why is WWE completely forgotten about the Intercontinental Championship in the past two months? Rollins could be one of the best champions they've had in years if they pushed him in the title correctly. I mean, that much was evident earlier this year. Coming off his big title win at WrestleMania, the guy was on fucking fire. Rollins was the hottest guy in the entire company. There is no argument. Hotter than AJ Styles, who was still the WWE champion by that point. Hotter than Daniel Bryan, who was coming off his in-ring return at WrestleMania. Rollins was the fucking man in WWE. Up until they had him drop the belt, which I thought was stupid. It led to a good series of matches with Ziggler, don't get me wrong, but it was still stupid. The guy was on a roll. They should have kept the championship on him long term. Yeah, he has the belt back now, but it's an afterthought. It's just a prop in the story they're telling with the Shield at the moment. I think the last title match he had was the one with... Oh, I was going to say the one with Owens where Owens quit, but that's not accurate. He actually beat Ziggler, I think, the night after Hell in the Cell to retain the title. Because Ziggler never got his rematch after SummerSlam. Um, but yeah, I mean, the championship was a total afterthought. Both mid-card championships are total afterthoughts. Yeah, Rollins is on the show, but the focus is not on the championship. Shinsuke Nakamura is not even on the fucking show. He's facing Rey Mysterio next week, which is cool. But, like, the U.S. title cannot be met any more irrelevant at the moment. The guy is barely on SmackDown. He's taking a backseat to Ty Dillinger in his mini feed with Randy Orton. Let that sink in for a second. How sad is that? So, yeah, I don't know what's going on with Rollins and the IC title. I mean, the Shield reunion stuff is cool. But then take the fucking title off the guy if you're not going to do anything with him. Like, put it on Owens. Or Elias. The guy should have won. Elias really should have been the one to beat Rollins for that championship in Money in the Bank. If they weren't going to run with Rollins as champion for the summer, you put the belt on Elias. Because he, he has not been the same since that show. He had a great match with Rollins. He has not been the same since. Owens. Rollins. You know, who else on that show could I... Bobby Roode. Chad Gable, any one of those guys would be better fits for that title at the moment than Seth Rollins, just because Seth Rollins, as great as he is, is not doing anything with that championship. It's no fault of his own, it's the entire, it's the company's fault for not booking him to be a more fighting champion like he was earlier this year, but you can't have him be champion and focus on the Shield stuff, you can't do that simultaneously, it's either one or the other, so either have him be a fighting champion or take the belt off of him while he's still with the Shield and give it to one of the guys I just mentioned. His third question, who are your early picks to win the men's and women's Royal Rumble matches? Well, Charlotte's an obvious one. I would not put the belt on Charlotte. I mean, I was thinking maybe Charlotte gets the belt back from Becky at Evolution. Honestly, no. I mean, okay, let's assume that for a second. Let's say Charlotte gets the belt back from Becky at Evolution. What now? Aside from maybe a rematch with Becky. What do you do with Charlotte? She's already beaten Carmella a bunch of times. She's still a babyface. I mean, I guess maybe Naomi, but she's a baby face. There's no heels on SmackDown. What, the Iconics? Who cares? Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville? Who cares? Lana? Zelina Vega? Who cares? So, I would, um, I would keep the belt on Becky. I think Becky versus a Naomi feud would be cool. I think a Becky and Asuka feud especially would be fucking awesome. With Charlotte as champion, there's not nearly as many compelling matches. So, I would keep the belt on Becky... 
have Charlotte and Chase mode for a while longer, do her own thing. I don't know what she would, who she would feud with or what she would do, but have her win the Rumble. I know that sounds extremely predictable, but it's setting up the inevitable Charlotte-Ronda Rousey match for WrestleMania 35 with Ronda. I mean, if one of them is going to enter the show as champion, I would have it be Ronda. I would have Ronda maintain the Raw Women's Championship. I think it'd be dumb if they had her lose the Raw Women's Championship anytime soon and then women and then win the Women's Rumble. I would keep Ronda undefeated till WrestleMania at the earliest. Um, and then have Charlotte go for the gold by after having won the Royal Rumble. And at that point, she can go for any brand's championship. That's what Asuka did. So I think Charlotte winning the Rumble and then going for the Raw Women's Championship would make a ton of sense. So that's what I would do. For the Men's Rumble... I honestly don't know. I really don't. If you told me a couple, like, at this time a year ago, oh, Shinsuke Nakamura is going to win, <clears throat> I would have laughed in your face because Nakamura lost twice to Jinder between SummerSlam, Hell in the Cell, and then he did nothing before the Rumble. So him winning the Rumble was really a surprise. People were, like, hoping for it, but I don't think anyone was really expecting it just because he was booked so badly in the remainder of 2018. So at this point in time... <clears throat> I don't even know who it would be. I really don't. I'm thinking of the current roster and, like, who makes sense. Well, Daniel Bryan. I don't know why I said that. Daniel Bryan. You have The Miz win the WWE Championship at some point in the near future. I know it's Bryan and AJ at Crown Jewel, but I think it's going to be a three-way at Survivor Series. I, th I think they were going to do the three-way at Crown Jewel, but they're already doing a three-way for the championship on the Raw side with Roman, Brock, and Lesnar. Or Roman, Brock, and Strowman. Brock and Lesnar. Brock and Strowman and Roman. So that's probably why. They probably didn't want to do two three-ways on the same show, two triple threats. So do the three-way at Survivor Series, have Miz win there, and then you can kick off Brian and Miz at WrestleMania after Brian wins the Royal Rumble in his home state. I mean, he's from Washington. He's from, like, what, Aberdeen, Washington? But I think he lives in Phoenix, or at least at one point he did. And especially five years removed from when he initially should have won it in 2014, I think he kind of writes itself. At Real Brett Vizek, or I don't know how you pronounce your last name, but your question is from Twitter, what should WWE do with Samoa Joe since he's out of the WWE title picture? I honestly have no clue. I really don't. I know he faced Jeff Hardy last night to qualify for the World Cup. He lost because he had that leg injury, still selling that from Super Showdown. I don't know. I don't know what's next for the guy. Um, Who else can he feud with? Daniel Bryan, maybe? I think that'd be pretty cool. I think a Bryan Joe feud would be awesome. Um, especially if Brian, I know he's going for the championship at Crown Jewel, so maybe he just kind of spins his wheels for right now. A Jeff Hardy feud would be cool, too. We haven't really seen that. I know they had a match on Tuesday, uh, but maybe they did not deliver a clean finish because they might go back to that feud at some point down the road in the next couple of weeks, months, or whatever. So, yeah, Joe, a Joe Hardy feud would be cool. A Joe Brian feud at some point would be cool. Joe and... Rey Mysterio would be pretty cool, especially if it was over the United States Championship if Mysterio beats Nakamura for the title. So yeah, that's a few different options. I think Joe will be fine. I do think that he should have won the championship at some point or another, though, during his feud with AJ. I think just I personally just think that he deserved it and would have been a great champion, but it's just a matter of bad timing because they're obviously stuck in this thing right now with AJ where they want to keep the championship on him for as long as possible, maybe to break a record. I'm not exactly sure. But either way... Um, I think they're doing uh, cool stuff right now with AJ as champion, and Samoa Joe never really got a shot. Maybe he could, he could always win the championship down the road, but I thought if there was any time to put the belt on him, it was during that feud with AJ. From at the most beautiful girl in the world, oh, sorry, at Lex to Giacomo, um, her question was, let's see here, um, do you think that NXT would be better off slightly longer, yes or no? Great question, and a bit of a disclaimer here. Bit of a side note, um, Alexis and I watched NXT together for the first time last Wednesday. I mean, obviously, I've been following NXT since the beginning, but she had never seen NXT before. We've seen, we watched Raw together, we watched SmackDown together last night, we went to a SmackDown show a few months ago in Brooklyn. Um, she has seen, she watched Glow, I mean, that's not really WWE, but it's still wrestling and it was a great show on Netflix. I figured, and we watched the pay-per-views too, we watched Hell in a Cell together, we watched SummerSlam together. I would said, skip over fucking Super Showdown. What a waste of time. But I did say we should start watching NXT. I think you would like it. And she's also gotten tips from other people that NXT is good. So we checked it out. She enjoyed it. She likes Johnny Gargano. She likes Lacey Evans. She's coming over tonight to watch NXT with me tonight, too. So we'll see who she likes from the other, you know, 
group of guys, the core of guys they show on tonight's show. Um, but yeah, NXT, I mean, we were talking about this over FaceTime last night because she was asking me, she had sent in the questions when I was FaceTiming her, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second with her second question, and she kind of gave her own um, two cents on why NXT is better off at one hour because she was surprised when we watched the last week. She's like, it's over already? I said, yeah, it's only an hour, and she said, wow, that was quick. And I said, yeah, and I like it that way, and she kind of agrees that, and I, I completely agree with you. I think it's better shorter, and I've always said this because there have been rumors now dating back years like back to 2015, I wrote an article for Hidden Remote in the summer of 2015 saying that NXT is absolutely right where it is at its best at one hour in length. And yeah, they've been expanding the brand. The brand now is more stockpiled with star power than ever before. But I think NXT benefits from only being an hour long. Now, SmackDown's great because it's two hours, but that's a different show. On SmackDown, you have advertisers, you have commercials for other shows coming up, you have recaps from Raw. You don't have that in NXT. You don't need the two hours for NXT. The 59 minutes that the show runs for on the network is fucking perfect. It's perfect. You should not need to change a thing. With the entrances, the matches, you know, you have a few enhancement matches to kind of make other people look good. Then the one featured match of the week, like we had Tony Nese and Johnny Gargano last week, which was excellent. There is no need for the show to be two hours long. Now, that being said... If the show is two hours, I do have faith they can make it work. Knowing Triple H and him being in charge of it and him knowing what talent is and how to book a show. I mean, they've made the takeovers. Like, the takeovers were only, like, two hours long at first. And they were for a few years. And then they kind of expanded to two and a half hours. Now a lot of the takeovers go, like, three hours in length. Not all of them. Some of them, like, one of them went, like, three hours. I think the, um, what was it? The uh, New Orleans one went three hours. It was an amazing show. It was one of the best takeovers they ever did. You can't give every match 20 minutes, uh, obviously. But what I'm saying is that they can take something that's on the shorter side and make it longer, if necessary. You know, if they made the show 90 minutes, maybe I wouldn't be opposed to that. Two hours is pushing it because it would be two hours of what we already see with one hour, which is great. But I think NXT, what makes it good is that at the end of the day, it's a third brand. It's a great source of entertainment for wrestling, storylines, characters, and everything. At the end of the day, it's still developmental. It's still the AAA to WWE's MLB. They're still making stars down there. And a lot of a, a lot of these shows feature squash matches, which, if Alexis is not aware, if you're still listening, it's when we watched a few of them last week on NXT. It's when they put a guy in there, or a couple of guys, like a tag team or something, up against local athletes, like losers, that aren't even employed to the company, like people that the contracted talent can just run through to make the contracted talent look good and pick up wins, build momentum, maintain credibility, and stuff like that. So uh, that, that's the pure purpose of NXT, to build up new talent. You can't have two hours of squash matches. That would get old real fucking fast. Sometimes it makes for a few hours, a few, you know, like a, an hour, a boring hour of NXT TV, on occasion. Because sometimes episodes of NXT consist of nothing but squash matches, but... If you have a few, maybe one decent match, and then one great match, it works out perfectly. Then promos and video packages, NXT does not need to be any different than what it is right now. I think the one-hour formula works wonders, and there's no need to change it. If it's not broken, why fix it? You know? If it ain't broken, don't fix it. Her next question, any general thoughts on the intergender tag teams? Are they progressive, add anything exciting, good to the network, etc.? Love you, boo. Keep being you. God, I fucking love you. I, I threw that last part in there at the end myself. Uh, that was a great question. Anyway, just to answer her question. Oh, I mean, she had asked the question first when we were over FaceTime last night. She goes, are, what are the tag teams that you call like Finn Balor and Bailey and blah, 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 like the Mixed Match Challenge? And I said, they're, they're the intergender tag teams. She said, you called it what? And I said, intergender tag teams. And I guess that was why she asked me that, so she can ask this question. So again, another great question coming from a girl that has not been a fan for so long. I mean, she's been watching now for a few years, but not like intently watching since I just we started dating a few months ago. Anyway, thoughts on the intergender tag teams? I think they're fine. Um, I love like Andrade and Alamos and Zelina Vega. I love them a lot. Um, it's kind of weird they're not in the Mixed Match Challenge show, especially if they're not doing anything on SmackDown. I thought that's a little strange, but anyway, I think that's a little weird. I'm not a fan of the Mixed Match Challenge show. I think it's a good show. I think it's entertaining. If you watch the show, it's very apparent 
that WWE does not pay does not pay close attention to Mixed Match Challenge because they're able to get get away with so much more on Mixed Match Challenge than they ever could on Raw or SmackDown. So I think it's a good platform for that to have some fun, but. In an age where we already have so much fucking wrestling as it is with Raw, SmackDown, main event on Hulu Plus, NXT, 205 Live, the pending NXT UK show, Total Divas, and everything else this company puts out, a show like the Mixed Match Challenge is not necessary. And last season was way better, too. So I like Balor and Bailey. I think they're a cute couple in storyline. I think in real life they're, they have their own partner, so... Can't say they'd be a cute couple in real life, even though they would be. Like I like I like stuff like that, but it's sad when like you look at it and it's like Finn Balor and Bailey. They're a great tag team, a great intergender tag team, but they're not doing anything. They're facing Jinder and Alicia Fox every week in meaningless matches. If you take away the mixed match challenge, they're doing nothing. They're probably not even on the show. So that's the problem right now with Balor and Bailey is the fact that I think with these guys, they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything with these people. Balor should mean a lot more than he does. Bailey should mean a lot more than she does. So I don't mind the intergender tag teams as long as they're still doing other stuff on the show. Balor's not. <clears throat> He's just facing Jinder Mahal every week. Bailey's just facing Alicia Fox every week. Whatever happened to the Bailey-Sasha Banks match? Or the Sasha Banks and Bailey tag team that we were getting for a while? That went nowhere. I think Banks got hurt or took time off. <clears throat> I don't know where that what happened with that storyline. But yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating. When the only thing that they have going on is the Mixed Match Challenge, that's not good. For people like R-Truth and Carmella, who really would not be doing much else otherwise, that's fine. But Balor and Bailey should be doing a fuck ton more than that dumb show. Final question of the day comes from at Jeremy8911 from Twitter. Thoughts on the double turn with Bobby Lashley and Kevin Owens. I thought it was well done. Long overdue for Bobby Lashley. The guy should have been a heel from the get-go. There was no reason to introduce him as a babyface. Now, I know he got the good pop, the big pop when he first came back, the night after WrestleMania. But beyond that, he was floundering as a face. So I'm glad he's finally gone heel. Leo rushes as his mouthpiece, I think, is a great idea. It works much better as a heel pairing than it does as a babyface pairing. I feel like they were going to do that from the get-go, but they wanted to wait until after Super Showdown, until after they got the Cena Bobby Lashley tag team match out of the way. I feel like that was what happened and why they did that. But anyway, um, I think Bobby, uh, Bobby has a lot more untapped potential in the heel role than he ever did as a babyface. So I like it a lot. And also, interestingly enough, it might make Kevin Owens a babyface finally. We really have not seen babyface Kevin Owens in WWE. We did for like an hour when he first debuted at NXT TakeOver Our, Our Evolution a few years ago. He debuted as a babyface beating CJ Parker before turning on Sami Zayn later on in the night. So I think Kevin Owens could be a good face if booked the right way. And he's already beaten and already feuded with every babyface on the roster. From Roman Reigns, feuded with Braun for a while, feuded with um, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, everybody. So you might as well try something new, turn the guy babyface, see if it works or not. And if not, you can turn him back heel. But if nothing else, it's something new and it's got my attention. It's piqued my interest. And I do not say that about many things with Raw. But they've officially piqued my interest with uh, Kevin Owens and specifically Bobby Lashley. He really needed something to sink his teeth into. And that does it, guys, for episode 254 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today. Thank you guys for tuning into the show. I appreciate it. Um, this was not my greatest episode. For some reason, I had to start and stop a few times, a few times just because I lost my voice halfway through the episode. For what reason? I have no fucking clue. I literally coughed once and I, like, coughed out my voice. I don't know what's going on. So hopefully it's all set by the time I record WrestleRant Radio tomorrow. Check that out on iTunes. For this show, be sure to like it, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more content. We'll be back next Wednesday with another all-new installment of Hashtag AskUSM for episode 255. Have a great rest of your week, folks. Enjoy your October 10th, 2018, and I'll catch your ass down the road.